Biblical Mormonism. Refuting Jeff Durbin on Mormonism and the Atonement. In a previous post, refuting Jeff Durbin on Mormonism, I interacted with and refuted many of the arguments of Jeff Durbin against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In this blog post, I will interact with and refute his arguments from a video, Answering Mormons, What Did Jesus Do? Which is a critique, from his Reformed Protestant perspective, against the Latter-day Saint understanding of the Atonement. Salvation According to Mormonism Durbin claims that LDS theology teaches one is saved through the Atonement, by obedience. In reality, this is a misrepresentation of LDS theology. Here is what the third and fourth articles of faith states, emphasis added. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. We believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, fourth, laying on the hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Such, of course, is biblical. Note, for instance, Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Isophes and Tunhammersion, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Outside of John chapter 3 verses 3 to 5, this is perhaps the favorite text used in support of baptism being salvific. Here, in this verse, we have a statement from Peter that seems to teach rather explicitly that the instrumental means of the forgiveness of sins is water baptism. The Latter-day Saint interpretation of Acts chapter 2 verse 38 can found in a revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith in 1831. Wherefore, I give unto you a commandment that ye go among this people, and say unto them, like unto mine apostle of old whose name was Peter, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus, who was on the earth and is to come, the beginning and the end, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, according to the holy commandment, for the remission of sins, and whoso doth this shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, by the laying on of the hands of the elders of the church. D&C 49-11-14. Proponents of the symbolic view of baptism have made much about the preposition ice, for, in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, which reveals much about the deceptive use of Greek many critics of the restored gospel engage in. Some have argued, following the lead of J.R. Manti, that ice in this verse is a causal, or, resultant, meaning, namely, one is baptized because they had a remission of sins before baptism. An example from everyday English would be, I took a tablet for my migraine, one did not take the tablet to bring about a migraine, but because of one having a migraine, then they took a tablet. However, this causal meaning of the Greek preposition ice can be refuted on many counts. Firstly, both baptism and repentance are tied together, through the use of the coordinating conjunction chi, and. If one wishes to suggest we are baptized because our remission of sins, then the passage would also suggest that we must repent because our remission of sins precedes repentance, in other words, our sins are forgiven, so as a result, we repent. I am unaware of any theological system that teaches such a view, and for good reason, it is a grossly unnatural, eisegetical reading of the construction. Secondly, modern Greek grammarians, even those who hold the symbolic view of baptism, have refuted Manti's comments about ice. For instance, Daniel Wallace, in his Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, an exegetical syntax of the New Testament, pp. 370-71, we read the following. On the one hand, J. R. Manti argued that ice could be used causally in various passages in the NT, among them Matt 3.11 and Acts chapter 2 verse 38. It seems that Manti believed that a salvation by grace would be violated if a causal ice was not evident in such passages as Acts chapter 2 verse 38. On the other hand, Ralph Marcus questioned Manti's non-biblical examples of a causal ice so that in his second of two rejoinders he concluded, after a blow-by-blow -blow refutation. It is quite possible that ice is used causally in these NT passages but the examples of causal ice cited from non-biblical Greek contribute absolutely nothing to making this possibility a probability. If, therefore, Professor Manti is right in his interpretation of various NT passages on baptism and repentance in the remission of sins, he is right for reasons that are non-linguistic. Marcus ably demonstrated that the linguistic evidence for a causal ice fell short of proof. Dot. In sum, his ingenious solution of a causal ice lacks conviction. Notes for the above. C.J.R. Manti, The Causal Use of Ice in the New Testament, J.B.L. 70, 1952, 45-58 and, On Causal Ice Again, J.B.L. 70, 1952, 309-311. Ralph Marcus, The Elusive Causal Ice, J.B.L. 71, 1953, 44. C.F., Also Marcus's First Article, On Causal Ice, J.B.L. 70, 1952, 129-130. Another refutation of this argument comes from Matt 26-28. Speaking of the then-future shedding of his blood and its relationship to the Eucharistic Cup, Christ says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The Greek phrase, for the remission of sins, is isophes and hammersion. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38, it is exactly the same, except in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 there is a definite article, ton, before, sins, not causing any change in the meaning. Here, we see that those who hold to a, causal, meaning of ice in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 have to engage in a gross inconsistency, or, if they are consistent, adopt a very novel soteriology, holding such an interpretation of ice, one will have to conclude, if one is consistent, that the remission of sins comes first, which then gives cause for the shedding of Christ's blood. The atonement, then, is no longer an action of Jesus in this sense. Of course, as with the causal interpretation of ice in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 is based on eisegesis, this interpretation of Matt 26 to 28, too, wrenches the underlying Greek out of context. Of course, only Latter-day Saints and others who hold to baptism being salvific can be consistent in their approach to both Matt 26 to 28, on the relationship between remission of sins and the shedding of Christ's blood, and Acts chapter 2 verse 38, for the remission of sins in baptism. Some critics of this view of baptism point to Matt 12 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented it, ice, the preaching of Jonas, O.T. Jonah, and, behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The argument is that ice here clearly has a causal, meaning, as one cannot repent, into, one's preaching or teaching. 
However, for those who make this argument, e.g. Eric Johnson, it reveals a poor grasp of how language works. In English, it is nonsensical to say, as the Greek of this verse reads, into the proclamation of Jonas, therefore, to make sense to English readers, most translations render ice as at. However, for a Greek reader and speaker, it is perfectly natural to think, read of one converting, into, the preaching of another. Think of the French way to ask for directions, in French, it is, pour aller, followed by, to, a, uh, and the destination. Pour aller, literally means, for to go, however, this would not be rendered into English as, for to go, but, how do you get to, however, for a French speaker, it is proper to speak of, how to go, to a certain place. Comments about Matt 1241 that justify ice having a, causal, meaning only shows ignorance of both the Greek language and how language works, as there if often an inability to render perfectly one language into another without a translator having to take liberties to ensure readers will understand it in English. Moreover, that modern scholarly grammarians agree with the traditional rendering of the preposition in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 are numerous. In perhaps the most scholarly coined Greek lexicon on the market, a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature, BDAG, the following definition of ice is offered, with Acts chapter 2 verse 38 being an example of the preposition carrying the meaning with, into, or, with a goal towards, within the context of Acts chapter 2 verse 38. One is baptized into, with a goal towards a remission of sins, supporting baptism being salvific, not merely symbolic, emphasis added. F. To denote purpose in order to, to, appian, libi. 101 section 476s aplex and equals in order to frighten. Just. AI. 21. 4 ice protropin, to spur on, ice agrin in order to catch something. LK 5 to 4. Ice apantison, synantison, hypantison teeny. S. These three entries, to meet someone, towards someone mount 834. 25 to 1. J 1213. Ice martyrian autoas as a witness, i.e. proof, to the mount 8 to 4. 1018, 2414 Al. Isa Hammersion for forgiveness of sins, so that sins might be forgiven Mount 26 to 28, CP. MK 1 to 4, LK 3 to 3, AC 238. Ice Namasanon Tinos in memory of someone Mount 26 to 13, MK 14 to 9, CP. LK 2219 Al. Ice Namasanon N 99 to 3. Ice Ho for which purpose, HDT. 2, 103, 1, Call 129, Other W. 2th 111 with this in view, Ice T, Y. WSD 417. Sir 39 to 16, 21, Mount 1431, MK 14 to 4, 1534, Hum 2 to 5, D 1 to 5. Ice Tudo for this reason or purpose MK 138, LK 443 versus L, J 1837, AC 921, 26 to 16, RO 917, 14 to 9, 2 core 2 to 9, 1 J 3 to 8, H is 1 to 9, just, AI, 13, 3. Ice Auto Tudo for this very reason 2 core 5 to 5, EPH 622, call 4 to 8, W sub, INF, fall, X, ages. 9, 3, mem, 3, 6, 2, just, ai, 9, 5, in order to, oft, lxx, neg, me in order not to, s, bdf section 402, 2, mount 2019, 26 to 2, 27 to 31, mk 1455 and oft, ice hoden for the journey 6 to 8. Evangelical apologist, Gary F. Ziala of, Darkness to Light Ministries, wrote an article entitled, Questions about Baptism. In an attempt to downplay the salvific role of baptism in Acts chapter 2 verse 38, he wrote that, are, apent, and, be baptized, in Acts chapter 2 verse 28, sick, he means verses point three eight have different grammatical forms so they are not both linked with, the remission of sins. On the other hand, in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, the verbs, repent, and, be converted, do have the same grammatical forms. But baptism is not mentioned, so baptism is to be submitted to after repentance and conversion. This is a rather silly argument, but it does show that the old adage, a little Greek is a dangerous thing, is alive and well. The term translated as, repent, in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 is metanoisate which is the imperative aorist active of the verb metanoio. The term translated as be baptized, is baptistheto, the imperative aorist passive of the verb baptizo. The difference, which the apologist does not tell us, is simply between an active and passive voice. Of course, as repentance is something one does, while baptism is something that is done to the person, that is the reason for the difference in voices. There is no hint whatsoever that Acts chapter 2 verse 38 separates baptism from the remission of one's sins, notwithstanding this rather weak argument. In Acts chapter 3 verse 19, the term translated as be converted, is epistrapsate, again, the imperative aorist active, this time of the verb epistropho, to turn, return. However, it is simply question begging to claim that, just as baptism is not mentioned in this verse, ipso facto, baptism is not salvific, in spite of texts explicitly tying it into salvation, e.g., Rom 6 1 4. Furthermore, it is akin to advocates of no lordship, theology citing Acts chapter 16 verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, as precluding repentance from salvation, in spite of other verses which are explicit in repentance being tied into the salvation formula, e.g., Rom 10 9, 13. Evangelicals, like Ziala, are guilty of implicitly denying the practice of tota scriptura, taking into account the entirety of the Bible's message on a topic an important element of the Protestant doctrine and practice of sola scriptura. R. C. H. Lenski, the great Lutheran commentator, wrote on this verse and how it demonstrates that water baptism is salutary. Our acceptance of baptism is only acceptance of God's gift. This is emphasized strongly in the addition, for or unto remission of your sins. It amounts to nothing more than a formal grammatical difference whether ice is again regarded as denoting sphere, equal to n, r592, or, as is commonly supposed, as indicating aim and purpose, r592, or better still as denoting effect. Sphere would mean that baptism is inside the same circle as remission. He who steps into this circle has both. Aim and purpose would mean that baptism intends to give remission. 
in him, then, who receives baptism aright this intention, aim, and purpose would be attained. The same is true regarding the idea of effect in ice. This preposition connects remission so closely with baptism that nobody has as yet been able to separate the two. It is this gift of remission that makes baptism a true sacrament. Otherwise it would be only a sign or a symbol that conveys nothing real. In order to make baptism such a symbol, we are told that Peter's phrase means only that baptism pictures remission, a remission we may obtain by some other means at some later day. But this alters the force of Peter's words. Can one persuade himself that Peter told these sinners who were stricken with their terrible guilt to accept a baptism that pointed to some future remission? Had he no remission to offer them now? And when and how could they get that remission? Absolutely the one thing they must have. And how can Ananias in 22.16 say, Be baptized and wash away thy sins, as though the water of baptism washed them away by its connection with the name. Aphesus, from Ephemi, to send away, is another great biblical concept, the sending away of your sins. How far away they are sent peas, 103-12 tells us, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Measure the distance from the point where the east begins to the point where the west ends. Nor does David say, as far as the north is from the south, lest you think of the poles and succeed in measuring the distance. Again Micah chapter 7 verse 19, thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Even today the sea has depths that have never been sounded. The idea to be conveyed is that the sins are removed from the sinner so as never to be found again, never again to be brought to confront him. God sends them away, and he would thus be the last to bring them back. When the sinner appears before his judgment seat, his sins are gone forever. This is what our far less expressive, forgiveness, really means. Nor does the guilt remain, for sin and guilt are one. Sin gone, guilt gone. Lenski, RCH, 1961, The Interpretation of the Acts of the Apostles, pp. 107-108. Minneapolis, Minnesota, Augsburg Publishing House. Hebrews vs. Reformed Soteriology. Durban Harps on Heb 1014, For by one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified, as if such as, 1. Proof for the Reformed view of the Atonement and, 2. As if such is problematic towards Latter-day Saint Soteriology. Durban also, correctly, urges the audience to read Hebrews to understand Christ's Atonement. Sadly for Durban, Hebrews disproves, not proves, Reformed Soteriology. Let us examine three important texts in Hebrews, 1, 1 10-14, 2, 2-17 and 3, 1 26-29. Heb 10, 10-14. And hoi thelamati hegias menoi esmen dia tes prosphoris tu samatos iasau cristau efepax, kai pa men hyrius estecan kath hemeron litorgan kai tushatas polacus prosferin thysias, hatins au depote dinantai periline hamartias, haudos de mian hyperhemersion prosinencas thysian ice to dianecus ekathizan and dexii tu theo, to loopen ectecuminos eos tethos and hoi ekthroi auto hypopodian ton potinato, mi i gar prosphori teteliocan ice to dianecus tus hagiosomenus. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. In the view of many evangelicals, this pericope proves that the believer cannot fall from their salvation and that salvation is a once for all event, being tied into one of the many theologies of eternal security, e.g., perseverance of the saints within Reformed soteriology. First, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 is a somewhat obscure grammatical choice of words by the writer. It should first be noted that Heb 10:14, for by one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified, is ambiguous in the Greek. The verse contains the present participle tus hagiosomenus, those being sanctified. This present participle could be related to the perfect tense of tetelioken, he has perfected. If this is the case, the sacrifice of Christ is indeed once for all, epipax, but is in a progressive relationship to us, that is, at least with respect to sanctification. Christ's sacrifice does not give us a blanket forgiveness of one's past, present, and then future sins. Instead, it gives us a perfect forgiveness of one's past and present sins, but it is not applied all at once to us, as we know. Elsewhere from the New Testament that we must seek forgiveness of sins we commit post-conversion, e.g. 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 2. Had the author of Hebrews wanted to convey such a blanket, forgiveness is some wish to read into this pericope, he should have used a noun, e.g. tone agian, the sanctified. Something interesting appears in verse 10. The writer uses a perfect tense instead of a present participle. He says hegias menoi esmen, we have been sanctified. The difference apparently lies in the, we, of verses 10, the author and his immediate hearers, in contrast to those addressed in verses 14 which is an open-ended inclusion of anyone who will experience the sanctification in the future. This being the case, in biblical Greek, it is better to use a present participle, because only that form can include those in the present who are being sanctified as well as those in the future who will be sanctified. There is another possibility that tus hagiosomenus refers to the entire sanctification process, including, positional, sanctification, for the author and his hearers in verses 0.10, i.e. they have been sanctified, per verses 10, but they are also being sanctified, v.14. Heb 2.17. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. There are a number of interesting things when one examines this verse. Firstly, there are two purpose clauses in this verse. The first, that he might be a merciful high priest, is the Greek Ina clause. The second is the use of the Greek preposition ice which means into, or, with a goal towards. And this is coupled with the present infinitive form of the verb ilashkomai, to make atonement, ilaskthai. And this present, making of atonement, is, for the sins of the people, tusha marshes to lao. The author of Hebrews views Christ's ongoing office of heavenly intercessor as one that allows for the continuing appeasement of the Father to win the forgiveness of sins committed by believers, sins that were not forgiven at one's conversion. In other words, this verse presents Jesus as the heavenly high priest who, even at present, makes atonement for sins. This is alien to many theologies that think of one's forgiveness as being once for all. 
The author of Hebrews says Jesus makes atonement for sins on an ongoing basis. If one's then future sins were already atoned for when one appropriated Jesus, especially if one holds to imputed righteousness, and their justification can never be lost, this verse and its theology is nonsensical. However, Christ's ongoing work as high priest in the heavenly tabernacle is ongoing in reference to our own sins. Thus, the present infinitive form in Heb 2.17 conclusively demonstrate the continuing need for the application of Christ's work for our own salvation. Reformed Protestants are in the unenviable position of having to advocate a soteriology that is at odds with the witness of biblical exegesis. Ice to Hilliskesthi, for the purpose of making propitiation, ice indicating the special purpose to be served by Christ's becoming priest. Hilliskomai, Hilasko is not met with, from Hillaus, Attic Hilios, propitious, merciful, means, I render propitious to myself. In the classics it is followed by the accusative of the person propitiated, sometimes of the anger felt. In the LXX it occurs twelve times, thrice is the translation of. The only instance in which it is followed by an accusative of the sin, as here, is Psalm 64, 65, 3, Tush Asabi as Heman Sai Hilase. In the NT, besides the present passage, it only occurs in Luke chapter 18 verse 13, in the passive form Hilasteti Moi Toi Hamartaloi, cf. 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 18, the compound form Exilaskamai, although it does not occur in NT, is more frequently used in the LXX than the simple verb, and from its construction something may be learned. As in profane Greek, it is followed by an accusative of the person propitiated, as in Genesis chapter 32 verse 20, where Jacob says of Esau Exilasomai to prosopon auto and toi doroi kappa, tau, lambda, Zechariah chapter 7 verse 2, Exilasasthi ton kirion, and Zechariah chapter 8 verse 22, to prosopon kiryu, also Matthew chapter 1 verse 9. It is however also followed by an accusative of the thing on account of which propitiation is needed or which requires by some rite or process to be rendered acceptable to God, as in Sir 3 to 3, Sir 3 30, Sir 5 to 6, Sir 20 28, etc., where it is followed by a Dikian, and Hamartias, and in Leviticus chapter 16 verse 16, Leviticus chapter 16 verse 20, Leviticus chapter 16 verse 33, where it is followed by Tahagian, Tathesiasterian, and in Ezekiel chapter 45 verse 20 by Tanoikon. At least 32 times in Leviticus alone it is followed by Peri, defining the persons for whom propitiation is made, Peri auto exilicitai ho hyrius or Peri paces synagogues, or Peri tes hamartias hymen. In this usage there is apparent a transition from the idea of propitiating God, which still survives in the passive hilisteti, to the idea of exerting some influence on that which was offensive to God and which must be removed or cleansed in order to complete entrance into his favor. In the present passage it is Tush Hamartias to Lao which stand in the way of the full expression of God's favor, and upon those therefore the propitiatory influence of Christ is to be exerted. In what manner precisely this is to be accomplished is not yet said. The present infinitive Hilliskesthi must be noticed. The one, eternal, act of Christ, c. by. 12 to 14, is here regarded in its continuous present application to men, cf. Circa Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 to 2. Heb 10 26 29. On his Alpha and Omega Ministries website, James R. White has an article entitled, Hebrews in the Atonement of Christ. This is, in part, a response to pp. 102 to 7 of Catholic apologist Robert A. Singenis' book, Not by Bread Alone, The Biblical and Historical Evidence of the Eucharistic Sacrifice, Queenship, 2000. Near the end of the article, White attempts to interact with one pericope that is often cited, alongside Heb 6 to 4 6, as proof that a truly justified believer can lose their salvation, Heb 10 26 29. Before we reproduce White's comments, here is the 1995 NASB translation. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer a punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot the Son of God, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of Grace? Singenis, Ibid, pp. 102-3, writes. This is a significant passage for our present discussion. The use of the word, sacrifice, in this context demands an explanation as to why such a concept is even mentioned, if, as is claimed by non-Catholic opponents, the one-time acceptance of Christ's sacrifice totally secures and completes one's justification. How can opponents explain this passage when the ones addressed in the context of Hebrews chapter 10 are practicing Christians? According to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29, they have already been, sanctified. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 32 to 34 adds that they had become noteworthy for having previously, stood their ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. They had been, publicly exposed to insult and persecution, at other times stood side by side with those who were so treated. They, had sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property, because they knew they had better and lasting possessions. The warning is clear that if they now decide to sin, deliberately, then no more sacrifices left are them, rather, a fearful expectation of judgment. In an attempt to avoid the theological implications of this pericope, White, using some projection along the way, writes. Singenis follows up these comments with a reference to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29. He asserts this passage teaches one can fall away from sanctification. He does not show any familiarity with the question of who it is who is sanctified by the blood of the covenant in this passage. The great Puritan scholar, John Owen, wrote concerning who is the one, sanctified, in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29. But the design of the apostle in the context leads plainly to another application of these words. It is Christ himself that is spoken of, who was sanctified and dedicated unto God to be an eternal high priest, by the blood of the covenant which he offered unto God, as I have showed before. The priests of old were dedicated and sanctified unto their office by another, and the sacrifices which he offered for them, they could not sanctify themselves, so were Aaron and his sons sanctified by Moses, antecedently unto their offering any sacrifice themselves. But no outward act of men or angels could unto this purpose pass on the Son of God. 
he was to be the priest himself, the sacrificer himself, to dedicate, consecrate, and sanctify himself, by his own sacrifice, in concurrence with the actings of God the Father in his suffering. See John chapter 17 verse 19, Hebrews chapter 2 verses 10, 5, 7, 9, 9 11, 12. That precious blood of Christ, wherein or whereby he was sanctified, and dedicated unto God as the eternal high priest of the church, this they esteemed an unholy thing, that is, such as would have no such effect as to consecrate him unto God in his office. John Owen, Commentary on Hebrews, Volume 22, page 676. I will admit that when I first read White's comments, it struck me as rather desperate, but forced upon him due to his a priori assumption that reformed soteriology must be biblical. In an article responding to White, no longer accessible online, but a copy is in my possession for those who wish to read it, James White's feature article, and the Calvinist dance around the book of Hebrews, Singenis wrote in response. Obviously, Owen can't admit that the one sanctified in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 is a Christian, for that would mean that the Christian could lose his sanctification, and if he lost his sanctification, he would lose his justification, and if he lost his justification, it means he was never predestined to salvation in the first place, and thus, you see, the whole edifice of Calvinism would topple in one fell swoop. Suffice it to say, the only ones who even dare interpret Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 in the way White is suggesting are the Calvinists. But, of course, once they make such a claim, then they create other exegetical problems out of which there is no escape. They are stuck with explaining how Christ can be sanctified by the blood of the covenant, when the word sanctified, or its derivatives are never mentioned as occurring with or to Christ. Perhaps White would like to start a new religion based on the fact that he thinks Christ was sanctified, but it will be a religion that has no basis in the Bible, for the Bible simply does not teach such a heretical idea. They also must explain how and why the Hebrew writer, in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29, suddenly shifts from talking about the Christian, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant, to an abrupt reference to Christ in mid-sentence, by which he was sanctified. I have searched all my Greek lexical and grammatical aids, and not one of them says that it is grammatically justifiable to say that the he of, by which he was sanctified, is anything but the Christian spoken about in, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant. In short, this is an outlandish claim of White's, and it is just as heretical as his suggestion that Christ is the one who is sanctified. But this is what White is reduced to saying of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 in order to attempt to save face for Calvinism. It's obvious why White didn't cite any Greek grammars to support his claim, since none of them do so. The only thing he could find is some centuries-old Calvinist writer, who didn't even address the Greek of the passage, as his only authoritative source. That, speaks volumes of the shoddy research and poor exegetical abilities of James White. One fatal flaw leads to another. While I disagree with Singenis on the thesis of his book, that the Catholic Mass is both biblical and historical, he is both spot on in his book in rejecting eternal security, perseverance of the saints as being biblical in this rather desperate attempt to avoid the clear meaning of Heb 10:26-29 from both White and Owen. While the verb agiazo can have the sense of to consecrate, and is used of Jesus in John chapter 10 verses 35 to 36, 1719 and 1 Pet 315, the meaning in Heb 10:29 is clearly soteriological, so cannot be used of Jesus but of redeemed, justified Christians. If Owen and White were consistent, they would have to argue, as do many Christadelphians, that Jesus offered up a sacrifice for himself for his own sins, in the CD view, the sin of being human, not that White or Owen would hold to such, they would agree that Christ was sinless, but such is the precarious position one is placed with such eisegetical nonsense. Indeed, the other Reformed commentators I have examined on this epistle while agreeing with White's soteriology and belief a true believer could never lose their salvation, reject this strained reading, i.e., Christ is the one sanctified in Heb 1029, not a Christian. For instance, one recent commentary wrote the following. We should also note that the author speaks of the blood, by which, the readers were, sanctified, aegis. Here is powerful evidence that those addressed are truly believers, confirming what was argued in 6, 4-5, for Jesus' blood sanctifies, and sets them apart, cf. 13:12 and 2:11. Jesus by his once for all offering, perfected forever those who are sanctified, 10:14. Sanctification here is definitive and positional rather than progressive. It is awkward and unnatural to see a reference to Jesus in the pronoun instead of believers, for it makes little sense to say Jesus was sanctified by his own blood. Jesus is the one who sanctifies in Hebrews, 2:11, not the one who is sanctified. Indeed, in chapters 10 and 13 the author clearly states three times that the death of Jesus sanctifies believers, 10:10, 14, 12, 12. Nor is it persuasive to say that the sanctification is not saving, comparing it to the sanctification under the Old Covenant, 9:13, which only sanctified externally. The argument fails to persuade, for the point in Hebrews is that Jesus' sacrifice stands in contrast to the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. His sacrifice is effective and truly brings sanctification. To say that his sacrifice only sanctifies externally, like the sacrifices of the Old Covenant, misses one of the major themes of the letter. Contrary to OT sacrifices, Jesus' sacrifice truly cleanses the conscience. Thomas R. Schreiner, Commentary on Hebrews, Biblical Theology for Christian Proclamation, Nashville, Holman Reference, 2015, 327. James White's theological mentor, John Calvin, also believed that those who are said to be sanctified in Heb 1029 are Christians, not the person of Christ. The blood of the covenant, etc. He enhances ingratitude by a comparison with the benefits. It is the greatest indignity to count the blood of Christ unholy, by which our holiness is effected. This is done by those who depart from the faith. For our faith looks not on the naked doctrine, but on the blood by which our salvation has been ratified. He calls it the blood of the covenant, because then only were the promises made sure to us when this pledge was added. But he points out the manner of this confirmation by saying that we are sanctified. For the bloodshed would avail us nothing, except we were sprinkled with it by the Holy Spirit, and hence come our expiation and sanctification. The apostle at the same time alludes to the ancient rite of sprinkling, which availed not to real sanctification, but was only its shadow or image. As with so many areas, James White fails on, 1, biblical exegetical grounds and, 2, presents a marginal interpretation, out of desperation to prop up belief in Calvinism, of Heb 1029 that is a rejected view even within reform circles, both historical and modern. 
As an aside, for a detailed exegetical response to John Owen's The Death of Death and the Death of Christ, a work White is rather fond of, see Norman F. Doughty, Did Christ Die Only for the Elect? A Treatise on the Extent of Christ's Atonement, 2 D. Ed., Eugene, Oreg, Wyff and Stock, 1978. One could go on, but it is clear that Hebrews, 1, poses no problems for LDS theology and, 2, disproves Reformed soteriology. 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 2 in the intercession of Christ. Durbin, in his comments on the biblical teaching on the atonement, harps on his absolutized reading of Heb 1014, which we have seen to be eisegetical, and the fact Christ is sitting, not standing. Let us deal with these issues. Firstly, a problematic text about the nature of Christ's atonement for those who are reformed is that of 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 2. The ESV renders the verse as follows, emphasis added. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In this verse, John is speaking to Christian believers of his time and states that not only was, is Christ an atoning sacrifice, ilasmos, for their then past sins but is presently an atoning sacrifice for their then future sins. Why is this problematic? In Reformed soteriology, when an individual is pronounced, justified, all their past, present, and then future sins are forgiven, a blanket forgiveness, if you will. However, the text is pretty clear that a true believer will not only sin, but such sins will have to be repented of and forgiven by Jesus Christ. This is brought out when one looks at the Greek. The phrase, we have an advocate, translates pericleton akomen, where the present text of, to have, echo coupled with the Greek term parakletus, which refers to an advocate, an individual who pleads another's cause in their place, which is related to the intercessory work of Jesus Christ being tied into the perseverance of Christians in their ultimate salvation, something we find in a host of biblical texts, such as, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Rom 8, 33-34. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he liveth to make intercession for them. Heb 7 24 25. We see a very potent example of this in Rev 5 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. In this passage, John sees a vision of the heavenly tabernacle, where Jesus is presented as being a lamb. The term, as it had been slain, translates the Greek term hos espigmenon where the term os, like, is, coupled with perfect passive participle of the verbs phaza, to slay, therefore, depicting Jesus, in his post-resurrection state, in a sacrificial role, paralleling the slaughter of the Passover lamb. Furthermore, Jesus is not sitting, but standing, indicating activity on his behalf, cf. Acts chapter 7 verses 55 to 56, Heb 8 to 1 3, namely, his intercessory work before God the Father, applying the benefits of his atoning sacrifice for his people until he comes in glory. Further, as we learn in VV.8-9, the potency of the prayers offered by the disembodied elders have their basis on this intercessory work. Similarly, the potency of our prayers have power due to the prayers and intercessory work of Christ. Our mediator, cf. 1 Tim 2-5. The term, he is the propitiation for our sins, translates the Greek autos hilismos estin peri ton hamersion hemen. The ESV and other translations are correct in rendering Christ being a present atoning sacrifice. Propitiation, as the verb, to be, I me, is in the present tense, estin, he is. This is commensurate with texts such as Heb 2 17, where the author of Hebrews presents Jesus as a present propitiation, not merely a past propitiation, for the sins of true believers. 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 to 10 confirms the focus on the present sins of the Christian that need forgiveness. Verse 6 speaks of those who claim to have fellowship and yet walk in darkness, i.e. are engaged in unrepentant sin. In verse 7, the author provides the remedy to such, viz. the blood of Jesus Christ, that clean seth us from all sin, allowing restoration of fellowship. This is reinforced in VV.8 and 10 that denies the claim that a Christian is without sin, while verses 9 encourages the sinner to repent, upon which God will forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The pronouns used indicate that the author included himself in such warnings and is one who needs to engage in repentance and have his then-future sins forgiven, too. John continues by qualifying the scope of Christ's atoning sacrifice. He is not just the propitiation for the sins of believers, our sins, but also but also, for the whole world. The term, whole world, translates the Greek to cosmo. The term cosmos in all 17 occurrences in 1 John does not have the restrictive meaning that is required by Reformed theology which states that Christ died only for the elect and makes intercession only for the elect, limited atonement, aka particular redemption, the L, in the tulip. Let us quote from some representative examples, again from the ESV, as it is a popular translation among many Reformed Protestants. For all that is in the world, cosmos, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father but is from the world. 1 John chapter 2 verse 16. But if anyone has the world's, cosmos, goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? 1 John chapter 3 verse 17. They are from the world, cosmos, therefore they speak from the world, cosmos, and the world listens to them. 1 John chapter 4 verse 5. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world, Cosmos. 1 John chapter 4 verse 14. The latter texts are interesting as the title, Savior, Soter, is predicated upon Jesus and his role as a Savior is said to be for the world, not just a select few arbitrarily chosen by God in the eternal past, cf. John chapter 4 verse 42. Some Reformed apologists try to answer the implications of the phrase, the whole world, by claiming that John is writing to Jewish converts to Christianity, and is simply stating that Christ has elect from among both the Jews and the Gentiles. So, the whole world, should mean, Jew and Gentile. 
However, such as a complete and utter stretch. For Jews, there were only two ethnic categories one belonged to. One was either a Jew or a Gentile, so everybody would be in view. When read exegetically, 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 2 shows that, 1. Christ is a present propitiation for Christians. 2. The then future sins of a Christian are not forgiven at justification. And as a result, 3. Repentance is not a once-off concept as some, not all, evangelicals posit. And, 4. Christ is the atoning sacrifice, not just for Christians, but the everybody. John MacLeod Campbell, a 19th century Reformed theologian who was critical of much of penal substitution, captured the extent and meaning of the atonement when he wrote. And he is the propitiation. For propitiation is not a thing which he has accomplished and on which we are thrown back on is a past fact. He is the propitiation, propitiation for us sinners, reconciliation to God, oneness with God abides in Christ. When we sin, and so separate ourselves from God, if we would return and not continue in sin we must remember this. For it is in this view that the Apostle, writing to us, that we sin not, reminds us of the propitiation, not a work of Christ, but the living Christ himself, and so he proceeds, hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments, the direct effect of knowing Christ the propitiation for sin being keeping Christ's commandments. And because of the power to keep Christ's commandments, which is ours in Christ as the propitiation for our sins, the Apostle, in words similar to those which he had just used with reference to the claim to fellowship with God who is light, adds, He that saith I know him, that is Christ the propitiation for our sins, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, the end of this gift of love accomplished. Hereby know we that we are in him, he that saith he abided in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. John MacLeod Campbell, The Nature of the Atonement and its Relation to Remission of Sins and Eternal Life, 2 D. Ed. London. Macmillan and Company, 1867, 197-98, Emphasis in Original. This is yet another text which shows, with great perspicuity, that Latter-day Saint theology is more reflective of biblical Christianity than Reformed theology, which most of our evangelical Protestant opponents subscribe to. With respect to Jesus, sitting, it is true that Hebrews speaks of Christ, sitting, on the Father's right hand, based on PSA 110-1, 109-1, LXX, denoting that he will never have to die again. However, other texts speak of him, standing, and interceding. Note the following comments from two scholars on the nature of Christ's intercessory work. Forgiveness through the intercession of Jesus. While not as universally attested as the view of his death is salvific, the notion of Jesus' continuous intercession for those who have sinned surfaces in a number of texts that otherwise differ widely in theological character. Paul expresses his conviction that Jesus is at the right hand of God, and intercedes, and tenchenai, for us, Ram 8.34, but he does not mention sin specifically, likewise, the author of Hebrews states that Jesus can also save forever those who come to God through high, since he always lives to intercede, and tenchenai, for them, Heb 7.25. It is possible in view of his subsequent discussion of the high priestly sacrifice for sins, 7.26-7, that the author here envisages a ministry of praying specifically for sins to be forgiven, but he does not say so explicitly. First John clearly associates Jesus' intercessory work with forgiveness claiming that, if somebody sins, we have an advocate, Paracleton, with the Father, Jesus Christ who is righteous, 2.1. The notion that the righteous departed pray for the forgiveness of the sins of the living is firmly rooted in several variants of early Judaism, and the phrasing in First John is strikingly evocative of Philo's articulation of this conception. What Philo predicated of the ancient saints of Israel, First John attributes to Jesus the continuing ministry of praying before God on behalf of sinners, at least on behalf of those sinners who have not committed mortal sin, see 5.16-17. Luke's narration of the death of Stephen, Acts 7.54-60, also assigns the role of advocate to Jesus. Scholars have frequently taken Stephen's invocation of Jesus, Lord, do not hold, mistesses, this sin against them, 7.60, as equivalent to saying, Lord, forgive this sin for them, and thus is expressing the notion that the heavenly Jesus forgives sins. But this interpretation appears to be based on the misunderstanding of, to establish, istani, and, to remit, aphini, as antonyms in one Mac. 13.36-40, 15.2-9, where a careful reading reveals that these verbs are by no means antonymous. A more relevant philological background for Stephen's prayer is provided by the regulations concerning vows and pledges in Num 30.11-15 LXX, which allow a husband either to nullify, periarain, his wife's vows and pledges by speaking out, or to validate, istani, them by keeping silence. In the former case, the Lord will forgive, katharisay, mt. The woman, 30.13. In Acts 7.60, Stephen analogously petitions Jesus not to validate the sin of the assassins, but to nullify it by speaking on their behalf, reserving for God the prerogative of properly forgiving their sin. This also explains better why Jesus is standing, rather than sitting, at the right hand of God in Stephen's vision. Acts 7.55-56, Jesus is not functioning as a judge, but as the advocate of his faithful witness, cf. Luke chapter 12 verses 8-9, who exemplarily asks him to speak also in favor of the enemies. This understanding of Acts 7.60 affects the construal of Peter's advice to Simon Magus, ask the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven for you, Acts 8.24. The identity of the Lord is obscure. If it refers to God, a post-baptismal sin may be forgiven by God without Jesus playing any instrumental role, cf. 3.19. If, by contrast, it refers to Jesus, then his function could be understood in either of two ways, as the one who actually forgives sins, or as the heavenly advocate, who intercedes for the sinner before God. The contextual nearness between 7.60 and 8.22 speaks for the latter alternative, as does the passive construction, will be forgiven, aphethesitai, which may indicate that the implicit agent of forgiveness is not identical with, the Lord, to whom the prayer is addressed. Tobias Hagerland, Jesus and the Forgiveness of Sins, an aspect of his prophetic ministry, Society for New Testament Studies Monograph Series 150, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2012, 97-99.
To understand the heavenly intercession of the Son on our behalf as the propitiation of the Father, as Michael does, generates a significant problem of internal coherence for penal substitution. According to penal substitution, the primary purpose and effect of the death of Jesus was to propitiate the wrath of God on account of the sins of humanity. As it is written elsewhere, because Christ is a priest forever in heaven, he always lives to make intercession, and is thus able for all time to save those who approach God through him. Heb 7 24 25. Heavenly intercession on our behalf is thus the ongoing vocation of the risen and ascended Christ. So, if the purpose and effect of the Son's intercession is to propitiate the Father's wrath, then the Son is continually doing in heaven at the throne what was to have been fully accomplished on earth at the cross. The cross would thus seem to have been ineffective, or at least incomplete, in accomplishing its primary purpose of saving humanity from divine wrath. Michaels, a reformed apologist, the author is responding to interpretation of 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 2, although given in defense of penal substitution, effectively undermines it. Darren W. Snyder Belusic, Atonement, Justice, and Peace, The Message of the Cross and the Mission of the Church, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Eerdmans, 2012, page 249n. 13. Many proponents of reformed soteriology have shown to be inconsistent with respect to their views on the nature of Christ's atoning death, its relationship to intercession, as well as the salutary nature of Christ's intercession. James R. White, for instance, once wrote the following. He enters into the presence of the Father, having obtained eternal redemption. Christ presents himself before the Father as the perfect oblation in behalf of his people. His work of intercession, then, is based on his work of atonement. Intercession is not another or different kind of work, but is the presentation of the work of the cross before the Father. The Son intercedes for man before the Father on the basis of the fact that in his death he has taken away the sins of God's people, and therefore, by presenting his finished work on Calvary before the Father, he assures the application of the benefits of his death to those for whom he intercedes. James R. White, The Fatal Flaw, pp. 133-134. Ulrich Zwingli, one of the magisterial reformers, wrote the following on the intercessory work of Christ. For as he, Christ, offered himself once on the cross and again to the Father in heaven, so he won and obtained remission of sins in the joy of everlasting happiness. The Latin works of Huldreich Zwingli, trans, Macaulay Jackson, two vols. 2. 276. This inconsistency is also part and parcel of John Calvin's soteriology as well as those who, like James White, subscribe to such a forensic model of atonement. In the book by Robert Peterson, Calvin and the Atonement, we read the following on the topic of Christ's office of priest and work of intercession. Salvation depends upon Christ's highly priestly work of reconciliation. Dot, dot. The second of Christ's priestly duties is intercession. Because Jesus Christ has reconciled the Father to believers in them to him, he has opened for them a way of access to God in prayer. In the Institutes, Calvin explains that Christ's accomplishment of reconciliation is the prerequisite for his work of intercession. For having entered a sanctuary not made with hands, he appears before the Father's face as our constant advocate and intercessor. Heb. 725. 911F. Rom. 834. Thus he turns the Father's eyes to his own righteousness to avert his gaze from our sins. He so reconciles the Father's heart to us by his intercession that he prepares a way and access for us to the Father's throne. He fills with grace and kindness the throne that for miserable sinners would otherwise have been filled with dread. Institutes 2.xv.16. In fact, according to Calvin's commentary on 1 John chapter 2 verse 1, Christ's intercession is the continual application of his death to our salvation. Christ's priestly work of reconciliation is once for all, but his high priestly function of intercession is continuous. He continually intercedes on behalf of his people before his Father's throne. Robert A. Peterson Sr., Calvin and the Atonement. What the renowned pastor and teacher said about the cross of Christ, Ross Shire, UK, Mentor, 1999, 57-58. On page 58 n, 51 of Ibid, we read the following. Hoogland expresses this very well. The intercession of Christ according to Calvin, is not an additional act which Christ performs in heaven, different from his death and resurrection. His intercession is the presence of his death and resurrection themselves before the Father, Marvin P. Hoogland. Calvin's perspective on the exaltation of Christ in comparison with the post-Reformation doctrine of the two states pp. 198f. As with James White, whose book was written, in part, against the Catholic doctrine of the Mass as a propitiatory sacrifice, Calvin contradicts himself when he critiques this doctrine, one that is tied into Christ's intercessory work being salutary, showing the inconsistent nature of such a view of atonement. It is in the context of the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice that Calvin takes great affront at the Roman Catholic Mass. In the Institutes, he explains, the sacrificial victims which were offered under the law to atone for sins were so-called, not because they were capable of recovering God's favor or wiping out iniquity, but because they prefigured a true sacrifice such as was finally accomplished in reality by Christ alone, and by him alone, because no other could have done it. And it was done but once, because the effectiveness and force of that one sacrifice accomplished by Christ are eternal, as he testified with his own voice when he said that it was done and fulfilled. That is, whatever was necessary to recover the Father's favor, to obtain forgiveness of sins, righteousness and salvation, all this was performed and completed by that unique sacrifice of his. And so perfect was is that no place was left afterward for any other sacrificial victim. Therefore, I conclude that it is a most wicked infamy and unbearable blasphemy both against Christ and against the sacrifice which he made for us through his death on the cross, for anyone to suppose that by repeating the oblation he obtains pardon for sins, appeased God, and acquires righteousness. But what else is done by performing masses except by the merit of a new oblation we are made partakers in Christ's passion? Institutes IV, XVIII.13-14, Ibid, 98-99. Commenting on this aforementioned passage from Calvin's Institutes, Peterson writes, In Calvin's eyes, Christ's work was perfect and no other sacrifices are needed. Christ perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament sacrificial system by offering himself on the cross. His work is sufficient to save his people from their sins. Ibid. 99. The Reformed doctrine of Christ's atoning death and its relationship to his intercession is internally inconsistent and should be, as with the other tenets of Calvinism, rejected. Are Jesus and Melchizedek one and the same person? In an act of desperation, Durbin identifies Jesus with the person of Melchizedek, i.e., they are numerically identical, 
with Melchizedek being an Old Testament Christophany. Again, such only shows his lousy exegetical skills. Latter-day Saints have never claimed that Melchizedek and Jesus are one and the same person, and for good reason, there is not scriptural justification for this identification. Within uniquely LDS scriptural texts, the person of Melchizedek and Jesus are differentiated from one another. Alma 13 and D and C 107 are pretty explicit in this. Furthermore, the epistle to the Hebrews itself differentiates between Melchizedek and Jesus wherein an identification of persons would violate the law of the identity of indiscernibles, e.g. Heb 7 to 3, 15. As the following quote from Jesuit scholar, Albert Van Hoy in his, excellent, commentary on Hebrews states correctly, the association of Melchizedek and Jesus in Hebrews is not an identification of persons, but one of prefiguration. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 24. Much ink has been spilt on the term translated, permanent, KJV, unchangeable, the Greek term aprobatos. This is a hapax legomenon, a word only used once in the Greek New Testament, and some, especially commentators until the turn of the 20th century, postulated, as it was not found in other Greek texts contemporary with Hebrews, it was a term invented by the author of the Hebrews to describe Christ's priesthood as being non-transferable. However, since the turn of the 20th century, Greek papyri contemporary with Hebrews were unearthed, disproving this thesis, and this is reflected in most scholarly Greek lexicons and commentaries. For instance, on page 53 of Moulton Milligan's Vocabulary of the Greek New Testament, S.V. Aprobatos. In P. Real 2, 65, B.C., 67, in any case tall, a judgment ends with chi tala ta diot, sigma d, oris mena menine curia chi aprobata, valid and inviolate, ed. The legal formula, thus established for an early period, survives six centuries later in P. Gren I. 60, A.D. 581, Aperabatoa prase, inviolable, must be the sense, though the words follow a hiatus. Another example, also V. A.D., is in P. Lon 1015, equals 3. Page 257, a trota chi a saluta chi aprobatas, a contract for the surrender of property. See also P. Cat recto, E. A.D., equals crest. 2. Page 422. Enya aprobata estin, s git dinge, and denon sich nix andern last ed. It is clear that the technical use, compared with the late literary, A.P. Lobic Frin, page 313, constitutes a very strong case against the rendering, not transferable. Phrenicus himself prescribed aparitetos. What sense that would have made in Heb 7 passes comprehension? Vettius Valens has the adverb five times, C index, always as, validly, or, inevitably. It occurs in P. Strass I. 40, A.D., 569, rendered, unverbruchlik, ed. A Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature, BDAG, the term is defined thusly, emphasis added. One recent Protestant commentator who, while agreeing with Durbin that only Jesus holds the Melchizedek priesthood, rejects Durbin's antiquated understanding of aprobatos. The ten-volume Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, TDNT, defines the term as follows. In other words, the verse does not teach that the Melchizedek priesthood cannot be passed from one to another, but that this divine power is permanent and unchangeable, which makes sense in light of it being part of the power and authority of God. Nothing in the verse, however, precludes this authority being granted, albeit in a narrow sense, to others to act in his name. With respect to the term, order, here are how some lexical sources define the Hebrew and Greek terms. Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich, a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. Taxis, Eos, Ada, Eskel, HDT, Plus, Insker, Pap, LXX, EP, Arist, Philo, Joseph, Test, 12 Patter, Lone W, in Rab, 1, Fixed Succession or Order, Epic 3.2.2, Test, Naft, 2 to 8 and Taxe, and Te Taxe Te's Ephemeria's Auto LK 1 to 8, without N, Taxe in Strict Chronological, Order Papias 215, though J.A. Kleist, Transl, 48, 207 F, Note 19, prefers verbatim. Jehanes E. Lu and Eugene A. Nida, Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament Basido and Semantic Domains, 2 D. Ed. Taxis, Eos F, an ordered or arranged sequence, in order, in a sequence. Egeneto de Entoi Hyratian Auten and Te Taxe Te's Ephemeria's Auto, it happened while he was serving as a priest in the order of his division, LK 1.8. Benjamin Davidson, the Analytical Hebrew and Chaldee Lexicon. William L. Holliday, a concise Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. Asterisk or asterisk, CS, and P's 1104, SF, JB 58, 1, legal, case JB 58, 2 manner, way P's 1104, 3, plus or minus Al Debrat on account of EC 318.82, W, cello degree, say, so that, not 714. Ludwig Kohler and Walter Baumgartner, the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, H-A-L-O-T. 1956. Asterisk or asterisk, Fem, of, I Barm, C-S, and P's 1104, V-L-526-K, S-F-F-X, J-B-58. 3. I-2, E-Garm, Diso-55, with regard to Co-318-82, with, I, so that not, Alt. Lest, 714. That the Bible affirms that more than Jesus and Melchizedek hold the Melchizedek priesthood can be shown by the fact that the Davidic kings were the addressee of the following text. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. PSA 110-4 NRSV. This would explain why David and Solomon, who were not Levites, would engage in priestly sacrifices and other actions, e.g., 2 Sam 612-14, cf. XO 28-6, 2 Kron 613, 1 KGs 8. Furthermore, the term, priest, KJV, rulers, is used of the sons of David in 2 Sam 818. Here is the NRSV translation of this verse. Benaiah son of Jehoiada was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were priests. All this adds support to the Latter-day Saint contention that other people than Jesus and Melchizedek held the Melchizedek priesthood, cf. 
DNC 107. To understand the desperation many critics engage in to avoid the obvious claim that non-Levites served as priests in the Old Testament can be seen in this thread on the Mormon Dialogue Forum. With respect to 1 Sam 2.18, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod, one evangelical wrote the following, lame, argument. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 18 does not say that God called Samuel to serve as a priest. The passage says that Samuel worked as a servant to a priest, not that he was a priest himself, see verses 11. It was natural enough for assistants of the priests to wear a linen ephod, but this didn't make those assistants priests themselves. Responding to this, Bill Hamblin wrote the following. How about the fact that Moses and Samuel are equated in Jer, 15 to 1. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called upon his name, Ps 99 to 6. Here, in Hebrew poetic parallelism, Samuel is a priest like Moses. What about Samuel offering burnt offerings, 1 Sam, 7 to 9. So, 1 he wears priestly robes, 1 Sam 2 18. 2 he serves in the temple, tabernacle, 1 Sam 2 18, a technical term for temple liturgy, HALOT 1661 to 2. 3 he offers sacrifice, 1 Sam 7 to 9, supposedly a prerogative of priests. 4 he, like Moses is, stands before the Lord, Ps 99 to 6 and Jer, 15 to 1. The obvious conclusion is that Samuel was a priest, though not a Levite. Alas, since it doesn't match your evangelical theology, you reject the obvious meaning of the text. One can read the further exchange on this point on the thread, but it does show that evangelical Protestants only play lip service to follow the plain meaning of the biblical texts. Durbin's misinformed comments about LDS theology. Yet again, we see that, 1, Latter-day Saint theology is consistent with sound biblical exegesis. 2, Reformed theology is anti-biblical and, 3, Jeff Durbin is ignorant of both the Bible and, Mormonism.